Welcome to the Stanford Clinical Lecture Series in Radiation Oncology. Доброго вечора і слава Україні! Here's the slide for Stanford physicians uh, who can apply for Stanford CME credits. So you could see the number to text, and I'll also post it in a chat. Our today's lecture is on the use of 3D printers in radiotherapy, and our great speakers are Drs. Lori Skinner and Thomas Niedermeyer. Uh, Dr. Skinner is a clinical assistant professor at Stanford, specializing in external beam radiotherapy and uh, lately MR guided radiotherapy. Uh, Lori used to be a physics resident here, um, one of the most hardworking and innovative residents we've ever had, and we are very lucky to hire him. Uh, his special interests include 3D printing devices, something you will hear today, but he also works on uh, synchrotron, X-ray scattering, neutron scattering, um, molecular dynamics, and uh, Monte Carlo uh, computational modeling. Uh, he holds a few pattern, patents, and one of them is on tungsten filled 3D printed cutouts for electron radiotherapy. And he is a real uh, true optimizer of processes, uh, creating hardware uh, for the whole department and also improving procedures, uh, which is really appreciated in our department. And our second speaker is uh, Dr. Thomas Niedermeyer. Uh, he was my co-resident at Mayo Clinic. Uh, then he was hired by Harvard University and Brigham and Women's Hospital as a director of outreach. Uh, he helped incorporating a few satellite radiation oncology departments into Brigham and Women's Hospital Network. And he also reinvigorated the physics education program for Harvard Radiation Oncology residents, for which he received numerous our teaching awards. Um, he then was hired by Stanford. Uh, now he's a clinical associate professor here. He is a lead brachytherapy physicist. Um, and also a lead of physics education for radiation oncology residents at Stanford. Uh, he's also very involved in ABR, uh, which is American Board of Radiology, writing board certification questions for radiation oncologists and also examining medical physicists. Um, uh, he designed a few 3D printed applicators for GYN cancer patients, and uh, he will speak about the use of 3D printing in brachytherapy in particular. But first, we'll start with Lori. Lori will talk about the use of 3D printing in external beam. Uh, take it away, Lori. I will stop sharing. Thanks, uh, yeah, thanks for that uh, very nice introduction. So here's my screen. Oh, I'll click it again. Yeah. Here it comes. Okay, so I'm going to talk about 3D printed devices in external beam radiotherapy. At this point, uh, you know, uh, about half the department has worked with or collaborated with us at some point or other. Uh, but uh, a lot of this work is done uh, with the help of Amy Yu and our physics assistants, Clinton Gibson and Joey Schultz. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to divide the talk into th two main sections. One is the sort of discussion or overview. Okay. And then um, uh, I'll discuss some uh, specific 3D printed devices that we use. Let me just turn on the Okay. So um, <clears throat> you can broadly categorize 3D printing into three uh, types of printer. So the cheapest is um, melt extrusion uh, types of printers. You might also hear them referred to as FDM or fused deposition modeling. These use a little nozzle and a, a, a spool of spaghetti like filament that is melted through that nozzle and laid down layer by layer. And a little bit more expensive uh, and a little bit different properties is photopolymer resin 3D printers. These, um, these use a light source to cure UV sensitive resin. And then uh, 
more usually at more at the kind of small industrial scale you get uh, power diffusion techniques um, where you where you use a laser or a, some other um, binding method to fuse powders together layer by layer so just a, a bit more about the melt extrusion uh, fdm method so uh, you can see this dinosaur here being printed layer by layer and there's a uh, spool that is pushed through the, the hot nozzle. This nozzle is typically, you know, about uh, 0.25 to one millimeter in diameter. And uh, we use these fancy nozzles with the triple hole just to help the, the melt rate uh, go faster. You know, and uh, each layer is typically between uh, 0 0.05 and 0 0.4 millimeter in height. And uh, this gives you extrusion speeds of around one to two cubic centimeters per minute with the current technology. So if you imagine a bolus that is 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters by one centimeter thick, it's going to take you around 200 to 400 minutes to print on an FPM style 3D printer. There are also some of the constraints with different plastics. You have to have a minimum time per layer to allow each layer enough time to cool before you start the next layer. And so in general, these uh, these use uh, are mainly limited to uh, thermoplastics. So just a little, and uh, typically less than 300 C, although you can go higher than 300 C, but then you have to heat, I put the whole thing in a, a heated chamber, and then you also have to then cool all the electronics from the heat. But, but we just uh, restrict ourselves to thermoplastics that melt less than 300 C, we have these range of materials, but they're all broadly similar. They have a similar tensile strength. And they also have this, uh, often have this characteristic that the the binding between the 3D printed layers is often you know, up to five times weaker than a, a solid plastic part, just because there's microscopic voids and a weak bonding between the layers. So typically these FDM 3D printed part, parts, you have to be sensitive to the the uh, orientation in which it was printed is weaker along uh, between the layers, stronger along the layers. Over 300C, you, you can uh, get um, uh, more uh, tougher uh, materials, but it, it requires a bit more overhead in terms of cost and maintenance of the 3D printer. So there are some tricks you can do just with these regular thermoplastics. So, like I said, um, most of them are similar, uh, similar strength, some, uh, similar stiffness, or so basically all plastics, plastic undergo plastic deformation. But um, the impact strength, you can, and you get higher, slightly higher temperature uh, materials, you can get slightly better impact strength, you know, up to a factor five stronger. And then but then to modulate the stiffness, you can also add carbon fiber, chopped carbon fibers. So you, these, you can have composite materials now, and there's quite a few different types of composites that so you can modify a little bit the properties. So here we've got a factor three in stiffness by adding uh, carbon, chopped carbon fiber. Although you should still be aware, this is nowhere close to continuous carbon fiber, which would be like 50 times uh, on this uh, vertical axis. But these are just to show you, these are kind of two popular materials we use. So we have like a, this tough PLA, which is like a easy to print with a reasonable impact strength. And then a, a, a carbon fiber filled nylon, which is a little bit stiffer and a little bit more impact resistant. And I'm not going to go through it, but basically you can use the same uh, trick of a, a powder or a, uh, fiber additives to modify the properties of these uh, 3D printing materials. So you can add stiffness, uh, you can increase density, you can even add bicarbonates. So you uh, basically get the material forms and you get even lower density. And then you can get functional powders uh, in these plastics like uh, the glow in the dark uh, um, or uh, even scintillating.
Mm. So that's, that's FDM melt extrusion printing, but, but we also use photopolymer resins. So these photopolymer resins have, uh, oh, I lost the mouse. Uh, they, they don't use heat, they use light to, to cu cure a liquid resin into a solid part. And so you can just look at this video, it works by scanning a, a laser or uh, have a UV light source that's masked by an LCD screen. And you again, you're growing layer by layer. And then until so you have a 3D printed part. So the reasons we would use these are because uh, you can get higher resolution. Uh, you're basically limited by the spot size of the laser or the pixel size of the masking screen, which is a, a, a tenth of a millimeter or less. And uh, because you're not using a, a material that you melted, you can actually use very high high temperature resistant materials because you're starting from the liquid and you're curing it with light. So these uh, solids produced can have very high melting points, which can make them uh, autoclavable and biocompatible. Uh, uh, they also uh, they don't have the same weakness uh, uh, between the layers that FDM 3D printed parts would have. Uh, a drawback of most uh, resin 3D printing is that it's very slow. Or there are some companies like Carbon 3D that produce faster versions of this. But in general, if the resin 3D printing is slower, and also they're, they're a little bit more brittle, they, they crack a little bit like um, glass or, or acrylic. So they kind of fracture or shatter like a bit like glass. So an example of a use case for us is these uh, tongue depressors we use. So the clear part here is the 3D printed tongue depressor. We also add this uh, dental putty to the tongue depressor. So, and then the third process that we don't do in-house, uh, there are many online services, uh, um, or many types of this uh, powder bed fusion printer in sort of industry, like light, light industry. So um, this basically has a, a laser that you scan across the powder bed and they fuse a solid part layer by layer. So this, this way you can get direct metal, directly get metal parts. You can also get very high quality plastic parts with these, these methods. And again, it's very high, it's high resolution uh, and uh, you have good strength uh, between the layers and but you um, the drawback is the cost, but, and the second drawback is just the there's more um, maintenance and sort of uh, work needed to maintain these printers. So that's basically the overview of the three different types of 3D printing. And so we have the melt extrusion, which is kind of basically fast and cheap. Uh, but uh, you have to be a bit careful sometimes with the, the strength. And then uh, we, and the biocompatibility, and then we have resin 3D printing, where we have we potentially have higher resolution parts and have uh, um, good systems for producing autoclavable and biocompatible parts, so we can sterilize parts. Uh, and uh, this is the reason we use it uh, for tongue depressors. So a drawback is the can shatter a little bit like glass, these uh, low fracture toughness typically, although there are a range of materials you can print, print with resin. But... And then uh, on the sort of industrial scale, you have a uh, powder fusion uh, techniques, and these are very high resolution that allow you to 3D print directly metal parts, but they can be expensive and they need some space and some maintenance. So I have a, a question. Uh, which 3D printing technique is typically faster? But, so I, and I think Natalia's loading the poll. So the options are melt extrusion, photopolymer resin, powder fusion, or um, they're all the same. Okay, so the 
correct answer was metal extrusion, which 50% of people got. So that was the technology. So I'll just go through uh, some of the devices we make. So this is kind of a, the summary slide of a few categories of devices that we make and use in external beam. So um, I already introduced the mouthpieces, but uh, basically we have these resin 3D printed mouthpieces that we uh, can we can um, sterilize, and they have this ISO 10993 certification for biocompatibility, which means they've been tested for contact with uh, mucosal, mucosal surfaces and blood, and uh, proven to be relatively safe. And then we, to, to um, save time designing and, or we, we basically mold the part to the patient specific anatomy just using dental putty, so the soft putty that is mixed and then uh, hardens within a few minutes uh, to form a dental impression. And then we have a few different types and sizes of these uh, tongue depressors. Some are lateralizing to try and spare the, the the taste bud, the tongue from the radiation. So we have a little video here. Uh, there won't be any sound over the Zoom, but uh, it's just a, a kind of quick instructional video on how we make these. So like I said, there's a, we have some types that are designed to be without the dental putty. We just have a, a standard tooth groove, and then we have some types with, will be used with the dental putty. We'll just mix it together until you get a uniform color. We form like a, a sausage or tube shape. Uh, it's just recommendation for like uh, clean use. You see the physics resin here is demonstrating how you wrap it around. And then we have two types of putty, but a bit, they're all set relatively quickly and then bite down to form a dental impression. So um, that's just for my quality and safety. So that's my pieces. And then uh, another thing we do is, oh, here, okay, here's another question. Why do we use resin 3D printing for tongue depressors and vaginal applicators? Is it because the material is autoclavable and biocompatible? Is it that resin 3D printed parts are stronger? Or is it metal extruded parts would be too expensive? Or that we only have resin 3D printed? So the, the answer is that the resin material that we use is autoclavable and biocompatible, which is a nice feature of this uh, form labs uh, resin 3D printers that we use. So the kind of the most boring application of uh, 3D printing in radiation oncology, 3D printed bolus. So it's kind of well established now be doing it at Stanford for a while. It essentially allows you to get rid of air gaps on the and speed up the uh, uh, setup times for treatments compared to using superflab, especially around sites like the nose. And so we typically use the FDA method to print these. So print time uh, is, is between one and 10 hours, typically in about 15 minutes of labor. And the material is very cheap. And then uh, a slightly nicer method we have is, is because one limitation of a rigid, uh, the 3D printed bolus is, is, is rigid. So then we have a two step process to produce a soft silicone part that's to the patient anatomy. Uh, this soft part is process is basically 3D print a hard plastic shell and then pour in this liquid silicone rubber into the 
plastic shell mold and then we and then we had to wait for the rubber to solidify and uh, so this is slightly more labor um, and uh, slightly more cost but it produces a nicer flexible molless part and then nowadays uh, there's companies that offer online services um, there's at least two and one in the us one's called 3D systems or once adaptive, that's part of SIPCO. And they offer like approximately three day lead time. And um, they can uh, offer all these types of boluses uh, on a uh, sort of mail order service. So you send them your part file or use their software to generate the, the geometry you want, and then they'll print it and ship it for you. You know, one thing that this uh, Cipco adaptive software has is this modulating thickness bolus uh, algorithm they use to modulate the thickness, which uh, uh, limits the range of the electrons where you have variable uh, depth of your PTV. And then and another, they have a few speed in the ball that's where you want it. And so one thing we've been working on uh, quite a lot at Stanford is uh, to replace CeraBand uh, with 3D printed electron cutouts. And so this is basically a, um, a plus the black, the black in this top image is, is a, a 3D printed shell that's filled with tungsten ball bearings. So you can see in this lower image, and then uh, to uh, nickel use, we added this copper frame came over the top, which is 3D printed. And uh, we, one trick we use is this shell is almost fully enclosed. It's and it's printed at a 45 degree diagonal angle. That's because one of the limitations of 3D printing is uh, print or at least FDM 3D printing is printing overhangs can be uh, tricky and less um less accurate than um if, if a, a layer is not overhanging compared to the layer immediately below so we do this 45 degree trick to to sort of balance out the um the amount of overhangs in the top and bottom surfaces so these are the it looks like this from the top so there's a here the white on the top is a 3d printed shell and it has a fill hole and two screw holes, and then we screw this top copper frame on top. And so this um, this design took is a little uh, well. This design is the way it is because of a, about a year of testing and drop testing various different shapes. And so you can see what we had here is uh, an earlier design. So we didn't have the metal top; we only had a plastic top. What happened was uh, what Elon Musk would describe as a, a rapid, unscheduled dis disassembly of the 3D printed cutouts. So uh, that basically the tungsten BBs fly out everywhere. And we were particularly concerned about that happening over the LINAC couch rotation mechanism. Um, so we, we didn't want that to be bringing down the LINAC, you know, a day, potentially a day or more. So. Uh, the, so this is the, the fail video, and there's many of those fail videos. And um, we finally got uh, when we when we have this final design with the metal frame screwed into the three D printed plastic shell. Uh, we finally got a successful drop. So the, it does still and. Uh, slightly disassembled but there's no leakage of the bbs and this white there's a a white plastic part on the bottom to fail to describe that's the a bumper so we add like a, a flexible bumper on the bottom to absorb some impact so a combination of a flexible bumper on the underside and the rigid metal top frame on the top um, it provides a robust clinical device that hopefully won't leak BBs everywhere. 
And so we, we also continued uh, some similar uh, concepts in, and we're continuing to develop uh, more 3D printed shells with uh, filled with heavy metal ball bearing shielding. So this, this work's mainly done uh, by Joey Schultz and Clinton Gibson, but basically we're, uh, the idea is to have the same thing, but for lung blocks, total body, for total body irradiation filled with tungsten media. And then, and also the TLI, we have these, um, when we do TLI plans, we're often shielding little part section, segments of the lung with a, a diverging photon block. It's pretty much the last remaining use in our clinic of um, photon blocks, uh, but we now have this uh, 3D printed solution. And again, so this red plate is filled with tungsten ball bearings and it's mounted onto the predefined um, mounting holes on the block tray. And there's a fancy mm -hmm. script that just defines which screw holes are outside of the irradiated field. So we can screw in a screws that are outside the radiated radi field without worrying about attenuation from the screw. For the yeah, for the TBI lung blocks, the screws are within the shield, so there's, there's no concern. So uh, it's just an example of a, a dose profile through the lung blocks for so the old method we used was CeraBand. And now the new method is uh, this tungsten fill 3D printed shell. And uh, so you can see here, uh, we, have, we did some dose profiles through the CeraBand and the 3D printed blocks. And actually what, um, this plot's a little tricky. The important part is the attenuation, which is the low dose part. Uh, the higher dose part, is less relevant. That's just that's where there's no lung block. So that what we care about is the, the low dose parts matching before and after um, uh, 3D printed versus CeraBand. And actually, the 3D printed blocks were a bit closer to the designed attenuation, whereas the CeraBand uh, thickness varies so slightly, you know, a fraction of a millimeter, about a millimeter or so between. Um, uh, different parts of the block and also with, between therapists that made it. And so that that makes a 5 to 10 percent variability in the attenuation of the CeraBand block, whereas the 3D printed blocks we're finding a more consistent, provide more consistent attenuation. So uh, one more question is, what is the shielding material we use in these 3D printed lung blocks and electron cutouts? Is it steel ball bearings, tungsten ball bearings, lead shot, or water? Okay, so the right answer is tungsten ball bearings, because the reason for this is uh, tungsten has a density of the tungsten alloy uh, specifically has a density of around 17 and a half grams per cc, which is uh, is basically the densest cheap material you can get. You know, everything that's denser is like platinum or gold. The lead is only 11 grams per cc, steel eight, water is one. So some uh, some more devices as a uh, total skin. So um, we use the same methods as the silicone bolus to create a thick bolus that stops total skin uh, low energy electron beams. And then this way we can have a, uh, some hair preservation. And then here we had, we used to use these lead gloves, um, but we're now replacing these lead gloves this lead is, is toxic and uh, also is falling apart uh, with these um, silicone gloves. 
this sil- the black silicone gloves we used another trick where we we combined t- silicone powder with tungsten a silicone liquid rubber with tungsten powder to just to increase the density and minimize okay, the thickness of the and then pyjama this one i think i'm going to I'm going to skip, but this is basically a physics phantom that we use for SRS quality assurance. That's also designed to be printed. So it's of an example of something we can do. And then another uh, big thing we use 3D printing for us is uh, audio visual. Uh, I can't remember the acronym, but it's basically a video distraction system, audio visual therapeutic ambience and radiotherapy, something like that. So um, there was a very nice summary recently. Uh, we had a multi-institution clinical trial. If we get to the device. So basically it's just um, Dr. Hineke here is the lead pediatric radiation oncologist and um, she's describing how we use this thin radio transparent screen uh, uh, to help keep kids still during radiotherapy and how important that is to avoid anesthesia, daily anesthesia. So um, basically to make this uh, usable for the therapist, we started off with some like off the shelf parts and clamps and things, but you know, as um, we usually realize you really want it to be fast to clamp onto the couch and reliable, like parts not break. And also has to fit the, the small space that we have between the patient and the linac. So all these things led to more and more customized, uh, you know, 3D printed uh, design. And basically, if it takes you know more than thirty seconds to set up, it may not get used. So I think that's all the content in this video. So the sounds just difficult to get through Zoom, working through Zoom. But basically, the current, at least the current design now, we have this uh, basically a three D printed clamp and a projector mount, and then these adjustable. Uh, with telescopic and angle adjustable parts. We designed the mount now so that it's very narrow, so it can fit between, for example, our spinning couch top and the regular couch top. And uh, one thing with this is it gets grabbed and bashed a lot. So initial designs were um, kind of oscillated between two too thick and, and too fragile. So now we're kind of trending towards kind of flexible, so tolerant of being bashed, but not, but also not too thick. And so just a quick summary of the, you know, we had a multi-institution trial. So that in the trial we had 78% avoidance of anesthesia in kids aged three to 10. And, uh, you know, each uh, the anesthesia cost estimated per treatment is around $1,600. And, um, you know, this thing's been used at least 1,500 fractions. So that's sort of 10 to the 6 in, in anesthesia cost savings. We, we're given, giving out systems to different places. Uh, and the, the trial also looked at this uh, anxiety score. And so the simulation where we didn't use the, the video distraction with high anxiety and then after during treatment, we had lower anxiety when we used the system. And then further development, you know, making it more broadly compatible alternative designs. Uh, this is where I'm just going to skip, but there is more advanced functionality. So uh, one um, 
So I, I tried to go through like some example devices and technology that we use, but um, the real uh, the kind of non-publishable kind of more uh, useful information would be like, what does it take to have uh, clinical 3D printing programs? So you need time and space um, and, and money, but, but money, well, it's mainly time and space, at least for us. So the 3D printed part, we expect to spend around five to 10 minutes each part, just cleaning off the supports, um, performing some QA. So for our shielding devices, we weigh each shielding device to make sure that the filled weight is matching our expected weight. We have the right amount of attenuation. For bolus, we, we do similarly weight checks and shape checks. Um, and then speed, you know, you, typically we can print parts within a half day, depending on the size of the part, but usually most, almost all parts we print now, less than half a day to make. Design time, the clinical, like 3D printed bolus can be 30 seconds. Develop something like the avatar system it could be like 100 hours of design time. So it's just like completely, uh, you know, from zero to infinity, basically. 3D printer maintenance, longevity. Uh, so uh, we don't typically do too much printer maintenance. Uh, there's few parts that get kind of replaced periodically every few months. And uh, there's some like lubrication and belt tightening that we occasionally perform, typically only a few hours. Um, a kind of advantage of these cheap, low, relatively low cost, you know, most of our printers are less than $5,000. And usually by the time three to five years comes around, they start to get worn out, but usually they're more obsolete in that there's a newer, faster, better printer in that come out in that time frame. I think we're on uh, our fourth or fifth uh so of, um model of 3d printer compared uh, combined compared to when we started uh six seven years ago so uh space facilities so space for 3d printer is typically one meter cube so basically a three foot uh, by three foot by three foot cube um you can, in theory, have them in an office, but they're a little noisy and there is some questions about uh, VOCs emitted uh, from the metal extrusion printers and then the resin printers, the, um, the liquid, it can be a little uh, messy if you spill some of the resin, there's a bit of liquid handling, uh, uh, not in an office, but it doesn't really need a fume hood or, a, or anything uh, any sort of special lab space. It just needs to be somewhere where you're not sitting next to it all day. Um, power connections is typically about the same power as a, a PC, uh, wi and connections are similar as well, Wi-Fi and Ethernet. And then how many, uh, it depends what you need. We typically buy two of each type of printer that we have. So we have some redundancy and backup uh, for clinical devices. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but you know, n greater than two basically allows you to do, you know, n parallel devices. So if we have requests for, if we have four printers and we have requests to make four, uh, three uh, electron cutouts, we can do, you know, all those four in parallel and have a half day turnaround approximately. So our final slide on that, uh, Regulation and a little bit on regulation and certification. So it's a little bit of a tricky gray area, but basically in US, uh, FDA only approves and regulates devices sold in the market. And since we're not really selling our 3D printed patient specific devices, uh, there's not really, uh, it depends what you need. We typically buy two of each type of printer that we have. So we have some redundancy and backup uh, for clinical devices. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, but you know, 
and greater than two basically allows you to do you know n parallel devices so if we have requests for if we have four printers and we have requests to make four uh, three uh, electron cutouts we can do you know all those four in parallel and have a half day turnaround approximately so our final slide on the uh, regulation and a little bit on regulation and certification so it's a little bit of a tricky gray area but basically in us uh, fda only approves and regulates devices sold in the market and since we're not really selling our 3d printed patient patient specific devices uh, there's not really still not put, uh, clear guidance but we basically assume the role of the manufacturer and so we need to act responsibly when uh, making and using these uh, 3D printed devices. And I kind of group them into three kind of levels. So one is like external devices like bolus or the avatar system, not really interacting much with the patient or the patient biology. And the second is intracavitary devices like uh, tongue depressors and GUI applicators that Thomas will talk about. And the third level that we don't really even touch is, um, you know, interest, interstitial, inter internal devices. So for external devices, what we generally do is just avoid non-allergens like latex and then um, just disinfect and avoid using these external devices like bolus on mucosal surfaces or places where they might have direct blood contact. And then for intracavitary devices or where we know we might have some contact with mucosal surfaces or blood, we use this 10993 ISO certified biocompatible material and we'll have it sterilized. And uh, our, we use resin 3D printer, printers for that, this form lab system. Um, although you can also get melt extrusion um, parts and print and uh, that they're also this have this 10993 certification. They're typically a bit more difficult to make and um, uh, and, or, and print. But, uh, yeah. And then, uh, like I said, internal devices we don't currently do in our department, but uh, you know other hospital departments do make 3D printed parts that go inside patients. We typically are currently in, within our department limit, limited a bit to intracavitary devices. So it's a removable temporary devices, not like permanently implanted 3D printed devices. So uh, that's it. I guess I, I'll. Uh, oh, we also perform QA for every single patient specific device. So we shielding devices, we of bolus, we weigh them. And check the and do have one at least one geometry check. Uh, as an example. Sorry. Oh. That's, so yeah. So thanks very much for your attention, and uh, I'll pass over to Thomas. Thank you so much, Laurie. Very great uh, presentation. Uh, can you stay after the talk, Thomas's talk, for questions? It would be great. Yep. Hi, everyone. Hope you can hear me. Yep, we can hear you. So I actually wasn't particularly interested in 3D printing from the beginning. Um, I came in from the application side. I was interested in solving a clinical problem. Um, and the problem was... Uh, in um, HDR brachytherapy in particular for cervix. So we recently had an MRI and we were seeing the tumor in greater detail. And what was very apparent and also apparent from publication is the tumor is often larger than the dose you give with a classical Tenemann ovoid um, applicator. And larger tumors had already demonstrated to have worse survival. And it was also demonstrated that uh, putting needles in those parts that are not covered give you better survival. The problem is, is getting those needles into the right place. And that's where 3D printing uh, became 
our tool. So needles, if you see here, there's a, an axial slice of a tumor here in green with two OARs, a bladder, and a bowel. And if you have a simple tandem a dose distribution, this is a circular distribution, you're going to encroach into your bladder, encroach into your bowel, and you're not going to cover the side of your tumor because you cannot give more dose. Whereas if you have well-placed needles, suddenly you can make this oval shape, avoid your OARs, and cover the tumor. And the whole problem was how to get needles in those locations. There was nothing commercial um, that was available that really could guide the needles to where we wanted. So we decided to make our own. Um, what we did is we 3D printed uh, what is effectively little needle guides. Here's an example. Here's a tandem and ovoid applicator. And we printed these uh, little templates that were replacing the cervical stops to guide needles laterally uh, in uh, good locations to cover uh, the dose to the tumor. So we had an initial experience um, that was published last year in a red journal showing that you have a true benefit. Um, and then we improved our design to instead of having to put the needles way deep inside the vaginal canal, it extended out and it was much easier to insert the needles uh, and this was published this year. So this is the application I'm going to illustrate the use of 3D printing in brachytherapy. So I'm going to wa walk you through how to um, succeed through material choices, design, the printing and the QA of these applicators. So you've heard about biocompatibility and sterilization, and this was very important at the time when uh, when uh, when I got interested. Lori was already printing a whole range of devices, but they were mostly prototypes and QA tools. We didn't have any medical devices printers available, so uh, and that was a problem of material. So uh, you've heard about ISO ten nine nine three. Um, that's the biocompatibility uh, standard, the international standard. And what's, uh, uh, what's notable is that if you pass the ISO 10993 standard, you can permanently implant uh, the material into a patient. So definitely uh, it seemed like a safe avenue for what we're trying to do in gyne brachytherapy. Also, these materials um, are sterilizable, and they're sterilizable in many ways. We use steam sterilization, but you can also use gamma radiation, electron beam radiation, or gas. So lots of options. So there were suddenly more materials available, but you had to go um, to companies who had real industrial printers. We didn't have such printers. Um, so as I was looking around for a company that could produce this, uh, I stumbled on, a, on, on big companies like 3D System or Stratasys, which were already doing medical devices. Uh, for example, they were already making uh, hip implants uh, made of titanium that were then permanently put in patients. So I'm going to show you uh, how ordering your parts looks like. Here's Stratasys. So I've used Stratasys a lot. So that's the main website, stratasys.com. And as you can see, they have medical application. They have a whole page dedicated to it. So you can choose your applications, but they have a whole um, variety now, a whole menu of different biocompatible and sterilize sterilizable materials. Um, and what's nice about it, once you have your part design, and I'm going to show you how to do that, you can simply get a quote. So you would go in here, you would log into your account, and uh, all you have to do is upload your part. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit what the price is of, of the materials and the designs um, I've, um, I've undertaken. Uh, so typically the price depends on the volume. And as you see here, it's a few hundred dollars, depending or as low as a hundred, depending on uh, how big the volume uh, of your print is really. That is what drives the, uh, the type of print, the material and the volume. So if I was to start a new quote, um, what I would do, I would say, no, I'm not uh, sending that to bad guys. That's the export control. Um, I would upload uh, my file. I'll show you how to get that file. I have a file here ready that I'm just going to upload. Um, and then I can choose a technology. So Laurie told you all the options that you have. Here I'm going to do fuse deposition modeling. 
And the material I have been using for uh, initially those um, those Gain application is the Ultem 1010 resin. That's a, a very high temperature resistant resin. It's used in jet engine parts, so it definitely can take the heat uh, for autoclave. Um, here's another resin, and then you will see you can choose um, the uh, the resolution. You can choose um, the material, so you have a number of finishes. And once you have all this input, uh, you will get a quote, um, and uh, you'll be able to just have that part shipped to you. Continuing on here, so uh, the um, the next part that's important is obviously how to design. Uh, I came in with no background in uh, 3D design. And Delori was nice enough to um, to shuttle me to uh, a software uh, that's online. It's effectively a website called Tinkercan, made by um, by Three D Designs. And uh, in there, you can design your part uh, very easily using uh, simple shapes. So let me show you how that website looks like. So it's called Tinkercan. And effectively, if you know how to use PowerPoint, uh, you'll be able to find your way here in uh, in uh, the Autodesk Tinkercad. So you simply use uh, basic shapes to create your design. So here's an example of, um, of a standard design. Once you've designed a few, you can start with standard design. And you see here these, uh, these uh, uh, needle guides that I've shown you um, in order to guide the needles into the tube that, that spreads a little uh, wide. And so what we do is we have the standard design ready. We import the tumor that comes from uh, the pre-procedure MR or from a first, second procedure. So now you can see how your 3D design looks relative to the tumor. What you can see here is uh, the needles, which are those tubes here that cross through the tumor, um, are not able to cover the whole width of the tumor. And the tumor here is a little bit oddly shaped. As you can see, uh, there's, there's a little uh, side uh, part here that is difficult to cover. So once you have that uh, in your design uh, loaded in, you can then choose to rotate, translate, or bend the needles in order to reach those areas. So for example, here I am interacting with the bending angle of the needle within the applicator. It starts with five and then goes to 20. And now you can see that the needle is intersecting that region that wasn't reachable initially. And that is what's really special about uh, 3D printing is that you can uh, bend the needle. Instead of having to go a straight pass, you can start within the tube. And now I can um, choose how to reach that tumor uh, by trial and error. So there's a forward planned type of, um, of approach to 3D printing and designing. So we have standard design that uh, that are good for most tumors. And then as you've seen, you can import an MR, bring it into your design software, and then customize the needle position for the tumor um, that, that you're trying to, uh, trying to cover. So in our workflow, uh, like I mentioned, we have a pre-procedure MR. It also can be the imaging from your first procedure. Here's an MR. In red is the uh, um, the contour as uh, done by the radiation oncologist. Now to notice here, the MR does not have any applicator in there. You see a uterus, you see the cervical canal, and here in red, the tumor. And uh, the printing, um, as Lori mentioned, uh, can be quite fast. Um, for our workflow, it works really well in that um, the stratasys that I showed you, um, in order to receive your design, it takes about a week. But with the in-house printer, the Forms Lab, uh, using the Biomed Clear material that is uh, that is sterilizable and is ISO 10993, uh, the print takes maybe six to 10 hours. So uh, it really just takes a day to get uh, your part out and, and ready. Um, and with QA and sterilization, it adds yet another day. So we QA in every part. And the cost is very low. This print is about $5,000. Uh, and then what you pay is really for the consumables, which is the resin and a couple of other parts. And so this enables us to use one part per patient. So uh, we don't need to worry about cross-contamination. 
So we fully integrated this into our workflow. So this is now becoming step one of uh, any cervix patient that we um, that we approach and treat. Uh, we'll look at the imaging. We'll choose a 3D device that is uh, best suited. We are able to um, to fuse on the MR and um, and and import the applicator as it would look like. So before the procedure, we're already able to know if that 3D printed part would work and assess uh, how we're going to use it uh, in day one. In terms of QA, we QA each and every uh, device, but QA is fairly straightforward, uh, at least for um, those devices that really are just needle guides. They just bend the needles towards the tumor that we're trying to reach. Nevertheless, uh, we assess dosimetrically those materials initially by doing dose measurements um, versus TPS using film and iron chamber. Obviously, we can CT them to make sure that they have watt equivalency. Uh, in our brachy uh, practice, we uh, use GG43, so we assume everything is water. Um, but this device needs to work with the applicator that you have. So you have to make sure it meets the size specification, that everything is smooth, and then things fit within one another. So every device gets tested that way. Needles get put through, it gets slid over the tandem, and we make sure we can reach uh, the areas of the tumor that we intend to reach. Uh, the QA doesn't take very long. Nevertheless, um, it needs to be done. So um, in conclusion, um, there's many potential applications in brachytherapy for 3D printing. Uh, it requires a limited financial investment. Um, it is very adaptable to whatever you need, uh, since you make the part uh, around your devices. Uh, the clinical workflow is manageable. Uh, it takes obviously a little bit of time investment, uh, as Laurie mentioned. Uh, and we've demonstrated that um, this can work really well in uh, cervix HDR. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas. Very nice slice. Nice slide. <laughs> okay, I will open the floor for questions. Any questions from the audience? Uh, Thomas, I, I would like to ask a question about uh, designing. So you showed us a little bit of process of designing for a specific, specific tumor. Um, uh, that kind of uh, elongated and deviates a little bit to the side, so you have to bend the needles. How long does this process usually take? It's forward planning, and I was wondering if it's possible to um, optimize this, do an inverse planning type of thing. Uh, that would be very nice. Um, but I have to say that now that we have a tool, it really is necessary to do something custom for maybe 10% of the patients. So it's not very often. And when it happens, it is fairly fast. Because as you can see, we already have a, a basic template. And though it's just small modification from that basic template. Um, so the time investment is actually fairly short, but it would be lovely to automate that. So that's definitely something that's on the horizon. Uh, maybe not a uh, priority for us, but uh, certainly something uh, people are working on and would be great to have. Thank you. And uh, for Lori, the question is about uh, silicon bolus. I've heard that from you, from a few Ukrainian uh, physicists, they were interested in silicon bolus for breast or chest wall reconstruction patients. Um, what would be their steps, first steps? to start the program? So oh, yeah, you need, I guess first you need like a, a, Mel, a Melix G, uh, standard 3D printer. And then um, but basically the, the extra steps for the silicone is just you, you just need to, to mix the silicone and weigh it. Um, so you need, like, you need like a little bit of equipment like weighing scales and um, Ideally, you'd have a little vacuum pot as well, and like a small vacuum chamber to degas the silicone. But it's mm. not essential, but it helps uh, get slightly more consistent parts. So that's like uh, you know a few hundred dollars for the vacuum pot. Well, about a thousand dollars for the pump, vacuum pump. And I see, then, and uh, the, the printer would be around. 2, yeah, and then a few thousand. Yeah, like uh, yeah. 
or something that's reliable. Like, so you, with the male extrusion printers, you can go, go down to like a few hundred dollars, but then you spend your whole life uh, fixing it. So at the price point of like one to two thousand dollars, so they're pretty, they're uh, pretty hands off now. Um, they are more liable. Any other questions from the audience? Yes, hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, which software do you use to convert DICOM files or like the patient specific to STL? Is it some commercial or? Oh, yeah, we have um, an in house ISAPI script for, for Bolus. And, um, but we, uh, there is also this uh, commercial software from Adaptive, Civco Adaptive. They offer, um, we have that too, though we don't use it very often. And that um, allows you to export structures from the treatment planning, variant treatment planning system and converts them for you into 3D printable uh, STL files. I said, here you are using Electa, right? You're not using the. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Do you oh, know yeah. if there I are any tools for Electa? I think the adaptive software works. I'd have to check. Oh, I, like I think that. that yeah yeah there is also like like um yeah there's like free software that can do it also i forget the name now um, 3d slicer yeah right that's one yeah um but it's kind of painful to you clinically it's very frustrating to use that so i wouldn't recommend it um but in yeah, in principle, it's very easy to write a script to convert a DICOM to an STL. Um, but yeah, it's built into this CIP, uh, adaptive CIPCO software. Also, MIM can MIM can do it too, but MIM is okay. extremely slow. But it can be done in MIM. But whenever I use it, it's extremely slow to calculate the STL file. It might be better now. I haven't I haven't tried MIM for a few years. Okay. Any other questions? All right. I don't see any questions in the chat. Okay. Thank you so much for a really amazing lecture. We learned a lot and uh, especially it was very useful to talk about how to start the program, what it takes um, and what's important. And I like how you emphasize the Q importance of QA. That was really awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. I see you next Wednesday. Thank you.